presenting trains at the right time, getting trains out of the way that don't need to be there. So, as I say, there's a short-term piece of work that we're very much engaged in, and there's very much a medium long-term piece of work, which is how we make that infrastructure fit for the capacity that it clearly needs to have. That's great. Well, coming a bit more locally then, uh, Gordon rightfully kind of raised the points about the infrastructure works that are going to be happening on the Mersey Rail Network. And I can't labour strongly enough how much of a priority it is for this group to propose works in the remote on time and on budget. Because being very, very practical about it, as you know, the trains are in manufacture. Uh, it would be completely unacceptable for a brand new fleet of trains to arrive and then sit in the sidings as we're waiting for the, the infrastructure work to happen. And the question that I've got now is the infrastructure of on the Mersey Rail Network, like the rest of the country, is network rail's asset. Why aren't you making a contribution uh, towards this work? Because ultimately you'll get the benefits of that upgrade and you'll also be charging the track access charge back to the operator as well. So you know, we're putting all the cash in, why aren't you joining us with that? Thank you. I guess from Network Rail's perspective, um, so, so, so what do we get out of it? Um, I mean, ultimately, the, the work that we are delivering is for the rolling stock. Um, we have to sort of, we take a very clear and open view from an enhancement and a renewal perspective. Would we need to do anything? Does, does the work that we're doing for, for multi travel, does that negate anything we would need to do? Um, I, I, the honest answer we've had is, well, well it doesn't. Um, so, so could we continue to manage steady state, um, given the track access charges that we take, if you wanted to keep this rolling stock that you've got going for another 25 years? The simple answer is yes, we could. Um, it, it, we, we wouldn't need to upgrade the power, we wouldn't need to change the platforms, we, we, we wouldn't need to extend the platforms, we could leave things as they were, um, and we would just sit in the renewal cycle um, so, so, so it, it, it's pretty black and white, I think, from our perspective. Um, ultimately, we don't take benefits. Uh, the, the benefit is very much there for, um, for the people on Mersey side with the new trains, the new performance, the faster performing trains, the, uh, the better capacity. Um, it, 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 it's quite simple. Yes, the you know, the infrastructure is upgraded, but ultimately the benefit is for the passenger. Um, not for us. We, to work to maintain it, whatever it is. And I appreciate that, but I was appropriately so challenged back that I do think network rail organisation will get a lot of benefit from this because we're taking a the pioneer approach. Sitting when we think about the level of access between the train and the platform, we are making sure we've got one of that we will have the most accessible and equitable railway in the country. We hope that what we pioneer here on Merseyside, that's in the fullness of time. Spreads out and puts down the practice around the rest of the country. So, there should be a lot of project expertise that's learned here around this that can be then exported across. The other bit that I've got to make the point about is um, fully appreciate the role that will still be uh, maintaining uh, the infrastructure. But what we do with the brand new rolling stock should reduce your maintenance bill because it's lighter, frankly. So, the amount of maintenance you need to put in uh, should mean that um, you will get the benefit from that. I appreciate we won't get a final kind of answer on this, but we'd be more than happy to take a cut of the track access charges or renegotiate them with you so we can have cheaper uh, access charges. But one way or another, we're putting a lot of money in, we could if we could actually take some of that back. Uh, one way or another through a negotiation discussion with you. Well, thank you again. I'll, I'll take that away. Um, as it happens, I was starting from the Network Rails Board. Uh, on Friday, um, getting final authority to deliver the power of great works, uh, and we had a very open conversation about track access charges and, and, and how we calibrate and calculate and whether rejo breaking on trains improves things for us. So, um, yeah, it was a very, it was a very rounded conversation, but I think it was a very worthwhile one. And, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm glad we had that conversation relative to the facts you just asked me about it. So I will take that away. Um, and it's something it, we're quite open to, we're quite aware of. So, so yeah. Okay, that's great. Well, sat next to the finance director who's written that down, so we'll make sure that we can continue those. I think you're getting there, I think, quite yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's yeah. great. Right. Okay. Thank you. If there's no further questions or, or comments, can I thank Patrick and Mark for that presentation? Thanks.
that's for answering all those questions as well. And if you can prepare a future one to come back and see us, we really appreciate that. We'd be delighted to come back and thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, then. Moving on, item five is quarter one uh, emergency travel corporate plan performance and financial monetary report for this financial year 2018 19. And we've got both Sarah and Stephen who are going to present this for us. Thank you, Chair. Um, as Jeff just said, this is the quarter one emergency travel corporate finance and um, plan report. It covers the period of April to June 2018. The report, as usual, covers an overview of financial monitoring for the first quarter and performance for the corporate plan priorities and the eight corporate key performance um, indicators. The decision has been taken that we will rejig the format of this report for this year going forward. So um, the first part of the report will deal with the financial and the second part will be the um, corporate plan and the key performance indicators which Stephen will take you through. So section four provides an overview of the revenue budget that was set for 2018-19 and details our performance against budget for the first quarter. What you'll see is that on a phase basis there is an overall favourable variance against the budget at the end of the first quarter, which with broadly is the, uh, the pattern you would see in most financial years. Uh, one would expect that that position would change during the year. Attached to Appendix C is a more detailed breakdown of the revenue budget, which provides an overview on a service by service basis of the spend across the areas. The second part of the report looks at the capital programme and again attached to Appendix B is a, a detailed breakdown of the capital programme over the different areas. However, what you'll notice is that the to date is quite low um, it's about 3% of the capital programme. But again, with capital expenditure, it tends to be a slow building and um, you will find that the spend of the year is back ended and spend will accelerate in quarter three and four. The final part of the financials is in a new introduction and that is looking at the financial risk imbalances. And section 4.83 to 4.13 provides you with an overview of the level of balances held by emergency travel, an indication of the level of utilisation of balances that we are using in the year to support both the capital and revenue budgets, and an overview of some of the key financial risks that are arising from the budget and effectively will impact on the revenue budget if they come into fruition to some degree. And in essence, some of these will impact further on the positions of the balances that we have. Um, obviously, some of the key points are, we've, we've gone over in some detail. There are costs arising from the use of all of those and the rail schemes, which, if they do come to fruition, will be for the cost of the game for the travel that will keep them there from reserves. The other two key risks which probably worth just mentioning are in respect of the special rail grants and that being an unbudgeted um, pressure against the budget. If we aren't able to mitigate that, as it's detailed in the report, it's likely that that would mean an additional call on service for around two point six million. I'm happy to take any questions if anyone's got any before speaking to the next part of the report. Yeah. Yes, Francis. Um, page 19, 4 and 12. Uh, Fairly talks, um, sorry, 4 point 11, where it's about beautiful women and it says, with respect to the reduction in SRG, whilst there have been discussions with any other in the past, so these reductions in the absence of formal agreement to this and with correspondent amendments being made to the existing concessions again. Agreement, Mercy Travel is obliged to pay any effort as, as per the existing concession agreement and in, in effect per the financial impact or the current financial year. This means an additional 2.4 million under budget pressure against the rail revenue budget. If no agreement is reached with any effort on this matter, there will be. This will present ongoing and escalating pressure on the revenue budget. Talks have commenced with MEL to manage this migration thing, and then it 
carries on at a four point job. Failure to absorb the additional cost pressure identifies a problem that results in failure. Uh, further calls for 2.6 million for, uh, reserve, from reserves, which would reduce the overall levels of reserves to around 38 million. And then it goes on to 4.30. In addition, in addition to the above, there are further potential demands that could be placed on revenue arising from Mercy Travel's obligations as project sponsors for the three rail schemes. Specifically, in respect of the land issue, issues uh, associated with New Willow Station, with no recourse to any other funding to meet these costs, there will be a need for these costs to be met from the reserves. Question there, Francis, because you just um, read what, three uh, paragraphs yeah. in the report. Um, it was um, a small, if, if there's no. Um, how will this affect the reserves, the money that the government have to take money out for the reserve because this pro project is costing more than it should have done? John, do you want to deal with that now? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's a number of issues here, but this is why it's in this section. It's flagged as a risk. Um, the special rail grant reduction is something that's been imposed on us by government um, that reduces the money that we get to fund Mersey Rail, um, MEL is Mersey Rail Electrics Limited, they're the contractor for the Mersey Rail Network. Um, they're protected contractually from that reduction, so we're, we're engaged in a negotiation with Mersey Rail on how we manage that reduction in funding. Um, the issue around the Universal Station is that it was, in fact, I think it was Council Field that raised it previously that you will state any overspends on network rail schemes are effectively, us as the sponsor of the scheme's risk. So, quite rightly, uh, service reflected those risks within this section of the, uh, within this section of the report. It just underlines the imperative and the requirement is for us to mitigate those risks by trying to control network rail's costs in the first in, in the instance of Muga Willows, in the wider Mercy Rail Electrics, Mercy Rail Network, Special Rail Grant, it's about us working with the rail operators to try and identify cost reductions on their part so that they can live within this new financial environment or new financial envelope that we've got. I mean, broadly, as it sets out in the report, if we, if we can't do that, then will have to use reserves and the impact on reserves will be a reduction in reserves that are available for other things. And I'll just sort of come in uh, as well just to sort of say I'm, I'm really pleased that how this report structure because it does give a very open, honest, transparent walk to all the current state of play, including the sort of challenges that we face uh, in the future if we don't mitigate them. Um, and obviously we've got to remember that the reduction that is coming to us in special rail plan isn't something that we chose, to. it's something that the government has taken from us and we need to kind of look at how we, we manage that. I think the bit I'm pleased about is that we have begun those discussions with Mersey Rail. Even myself and C. Brodden with Metro Rail have met with not just Mersey Rail but their kind of owning groups of Serto and Abelio to say how are we going to work through this in a way which has minimal impact on the travelling public, because that's what it has to be, be all about. So I'm pleased it's flagged up there as an emerging risk, but please rest assured we are working on it to make sure that uh, it's dealt with properly and mitigated. Thank you for that. Are there any other questions on the financial part of the report before we ask what we've got in that doing our statement to, to do the KPIs? Thank you, Chair. Apologies if uh, I'm asking something that's right under my eye. Page 17, in terms of the chart for bus services, um, in the column of favorable, unfavorable variances, there's a six. I was trying to put the maths out. Can you explain it, please? The favorable, unfavorable variances effectively is the difference
Is that okay enough? Because I hope that explains where it ordinarily wouldn't be as well, because it's sort of scientifically on top of you. Okay. Stephen, do you want to take us through the KPIs? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of the KPIs, um, also as Sir alludes to, we slightly tweaked the report so it kind of addresses a few issues that have changed. Uh, one of the things is that we've done from the KPI side is to reflect uh, this is a CA strategic transport committee rather than referring to an updating for one specific merger travel operational business. That still goes on through director meetings, so it's not something that's stopped, but we're just trying to refine the way the result, uh, report is presented. Um, as Liam says, to go through the KPIs, because KPIs are probably the most important aspect at this Q1 point. The KPIs have run like this with similar content for maybe five years plus. So a Q1, it's quite easy to rag and rate where we're up to because we're, we're, we're tracking this over a period of time. Whereas the priority activities of Q1, normally you wouldn't expect anything to be in the red from day one, otherwise there's a problem. Um, I suppose the presentation that came earlier from Network Rail helps with some of the ratings that we've got on the KPIs. Um, as you'll see on page 20 and 21, I'm going to also stretch over to 22. So KPIs 3, 4, and 7 have been rated as uh, amber red, which is probably one of the first times we've really rated KPIs to be in kind of negative territory. They're not fully in negative territory, because that would just be a red. Uh, the amber end. Now, the reasoning behind those are a lot to do with the issues that we've had with the main timetables, the Lime Streets, because it's all about punctuality, reliability, and connectivity. So it's obvious to ourselves from the presentation, and obviously to a lot of the public, that there have been problems in Q1 um, with that. And I think it would only be right for our reports to kind of reflect that. If you look at the other um, transport modes such as ferries and bus etc they're, they're all quite good but because of the impact that this has had it you know i played my own good cop bad cop moments and decided i think it's only right to kind of flag this as an issue i think the thing to be confident about is that the q2 myself and also the, the officers in the departments uh, kind of that account for the work on these areas we're expecting those to go green for the q2 exception on the back on track line streets back over the timetables so this is only a temporary uh, blip, if you like. But the explanations are there to kind of explain. One other change we do have, again, reflecting the kind of strategic nature of what Mersey Travel um, as an organisation will be delivering for the CA through its transport remit, is we've added walking and cycling to KPI 2. At the moment, we don't have what we think is a solid baseline, so we've not presented that yet, but the teams in Mersey Travel that are not leaving on walking and cycling will have data by the end of the year. So by the end of the year, we will know exactly what levels of walking and cycling we've got in the city region. So the priorities are going to be different beyond them. We'll, we'll be able to see how they hopefully increase that. Um, there is one error that I have to point out that I'll obviously blame myself for, and that is KPI 7 on page 22, is amber red. Um, unfortunately, I didn't transport it correctly to page 37, which is KPI 7 connectivity, is a more detailed chart. It comes up as green, that colour should just have been translated across, so that's a slight error there on my part, but it's within the that was terrible. Give yourself a red for that. Um, <laughs> if we move on to, sorry, if you move on to the priorities, as I say, Q1 is usually quite uneventful, but what we have introduced here is a not started category in the past we might have rated those as green because there's no issue with them so what we've done instead as you can see when you add them up you've got which ones have not started uh, so we don't kind of mix it up as being off the target or started as we pick up through the year as sarah mentioned about finance you start to see things building up and uh, an issue it's hopefully not arising but uh, it gets a little bit more interesting from then onwards Again, just to point out some of the uh, practicalities of the report, we're now working to a set of three priorities. Um, the fit of the strategic function of MERS travel, which is advise, develop, and deliver under the transport remit for the combined authority. Last year we had five. So that should hopefully bring down the, the, the content that you need to look through to be a little bit more manageable, a bit more focused. Um, 
it's kind of the transitional approach with development to the CA um, that, that we're looking at. And as I said, the focus is on a, a, a CA transport committee rather than the kind of emergency travel work. So in relation to that, we've started to remove some, a couple of points. So if you look at page 36 and customer comments, we did have some elements there which were customer comments as in staff with emergency travel, about the IT services, etc. We didn't feel that was appropriate for a CA strategic committee because that's internal emergency travel work. As I said, we still collect that, we still report and that's still available if you wanted to see it. Um, and also, again, I was obviously having a really bad cop day because on rail, uh, they've got 99% um, resolution with it, so I can have give them an amber green. I think 99% is 1% off 100, I think that should be green. I've also been in about moving that day, so I don't know. Um, overall, the report is Q1, it's looking quite good. We, I think we alluded to earlier that we, in previous reports, we're going to turn the screw a little bit more and tighten things up. I think we've done that with the KPIs, so we're just testing ourselves a little bit. I think it's only right to do that. I think we'll go back onto green anyway later on. And as we said, once you get to Q2, Q3, you'll start to see some of these priorities and activities changing a little bit down. Something kind of more meets on the bones to look at. But at this point, there's no issues that I can see. Thank you. Well, thanks for that, Steve. I'll go to Steve first, and then John. Absolutely. Uh, round off both reports in the same format and the comments have received back from members. So I'll listen to what the members first have so to John, do you want to come in and then, then Steve if there's no other contribution? Thanks, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Steve, for that. Just very quickly on KPI for punctuality. I'm just wondering in terms of the way how we, Mercy Travel, are giving the message to this to the revised that it really isn't good enough in terms of accountability and service and what type of communication strategy we that. And then on KPI 6, um, over the page on page 22, uh, the time table for mystery shopping for elected members where people can't attend. There's some colleagues have been coming to me and saying we've not been all able to attend the mystery shopping even though it was conducted during April and May. Is there any way we can sort of extend that so that you know, most members are able to actually take that up? Thank you. Come in on the mystery shopping. That's okay. And uh, this is actually a mystery shopping program that's independent to uh, members. They're actually trained mystery shoppers who go out and independently evaluate the service. It's not led to the program that the council is not involved in. Okay. What about the ones planned for us then? Thank you. <laughs> it's a mystery. Okay. <laughs> I would hope there's many other things happening in April and May that are dedicated to your activities too. Um, no, I think we certainly will be kind of setting up the next round of that, but I just sort of remind all of us that every time we get our public transport locally with rescue shoppers, I was when I was on the 79 bus this morning. Um, because you know, part of our role is being the eyes and ears of the travelling public. So, but we will be getting a, a programme of um, formalised events pulled together again, John. Yeah. Any comments on KPI for? Uh, on that, we'll speak to the bus manager to ask him what his kind of activities are going to be that we're kind of offset to make sure that we can kind of kick up on that. Francis, if you've got a, a question or point. Um, on page 20, where you say that 19% of the production of commuters compared to last year, and yet on page 21 it says Mersey Ferry commuters is above target. Raju is slightly below.
as I understand it, again, as we leave, we leave them there for finance, that's all. We are in a similar position as last year, but not as favourable, slightly less favourable. So if someone's careful to keep that on board, then there's one thing about the finance is looking right, and if they, then if performance is poor, then anyone can save money by poor performance. So, so linking the KPIs to the finances is absolutely correct, and, and that's what, so we've got a healthy overall picture at the moment, but the pressure is on, and the pressure is, is really tough. It will be a tough budget. And when we look lovingly at 38 million pound reserves, we know exactly what those reserves are for, mainly linked to road stock and all, all those sort of projects. So don't look lovingly at those 38 billion folks and think we're a wash with cash if we ain't. So it is going to be a tough year, as it always is, so we just need to keep, uh, keep that message. The, the other feedback I got back from members, uh, sir, if, if that's okay, uh, for Coach Walter, you won the tables there, members found them, them quite helpful. But to make them a bit more real, um, is it possible for the system in brackets next to where you say total employees to put a number of employees next to that? Because really, employees and a cash sum doesn't tell you the whole picture. So, if, uh, and I, I'm not saying the ledger system will allow that, but just, just for one or two reports so we can have a look at what those, those mean in terms of actual people and actual numbers. If that's possible, that would make it even more alive than the members. But overall, uh, I work for Zeta reports uh, and, and, you know, steady as we go. Thank you for that. Um, as mentioned, the, the numbers just have come out of the ledger, but what we can do is provide a Visually as well, so that they can make sure that they get off and on at the right place. 
The Transport Select Committee panel well, here is a little bit more specific. That's looking at the sharp decline in bus use across England outside London over the last 25 years. A lot of it's been put down to congestion, car ownership, and an increase in online shopping and such like. And the Transport Select Committee is trying to look at ways of gathering evidence about the causes behind that so that they can work with the local authorities and the bus operators to try and improve the, 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 the offer, the bus offer, as it were, to try and reverse that decline. I think it's timely that they're all coming out at the same time because sort of the evidence is suggesting that a lot of it does point down to the information aspects of it. So if we can get that side of it right, that might help sort of stem that flow. Appended to the report, we've got two draft consult the two draft consultation responses. They're quite sort of specific, yes, no, explain your answer to it once. Um, and we've been able to sort of put together a, a fairly sort of rough but substantive response to both of those. And I'm also looking for your input into both of those in terms of anything you specifically want to raise. With respect to the Transport Select Committee call for evidence, we're hoping to, sort of to, to basically sort of structure that around the work of the bus alliance delivery of the bus strategy and the work that's ongoing in terms of alternative delivery modes as well. We've not got that response in any kind of format that could have been released at this stage, primarily because our head of bus has been on leave for a few weeks, up until the running of the, the publication of the committee papers, but obviously we'll be working quite closely with him and I'm happy to sort of feed in any comments that you're going to bring in today so that I can put those to and make sure that they're recorded in the response before it goes. So that's about Any questions or comments that you want to raise on those consultations, Natalie? Thank you, Chair. If you would permit me to, that would be nice. Um, thanks very much for that, Susan. Um, in regards to page 55, the qualities and values of the contribution, um, one thing that would be really helpful to add, um, you've mentioned um, in terms of disability, but in terms of low income, because if the bus fares are on the increase, Basically, people would not be, or even the train, people would not be able to purchase the tickets, and therefore it's going to defeat the whole purpose of getting people into public transport. So, I think that needs to be had in terms of, and looking at the demographics of the Northwest, and in terms of, in comparison to London, in terms of income. Um, so, I think that needs to be added on. Um, and just uh, another point, in terms of this one, um, I see it's, um, I mean, the committee members have been really, really good in terms of improving the quality of the comments for equality and diversity for, uh, for each report. However, I think we could omit this, members are reminded of the requirement because obviously, you see it for all reports, that line, and I think sometimes it just seems like it's just cut and piece. Yeah, happy to take that on board. I think the reason that I, I've always personally sort of left that comment in, I think it's my original phraseology that a lot of people have picked up, it's largely down to the fact that certainly within the legislation it makes it quite clear that the decisions that are contained within the report um, are obviously sort of non delicately in terms of the fact that you guys have all got to be fully aware of what the public sector equality is. So from my perspective, I've left that in as just sort of to hammer home every single time that as a decision maker, you're the, the ones that have got to be fully aware of what the public sector equality duty is saying, but I can certainly take it away and make sure that we don't keep overstating it, don't keep repeating it, and I think the message is that we're getting through in that respect. Rather than that, Barry. Thank you, Chair. There's not very good few comments that I would like to be concerned to be added here. Um, obviously, the issue around uh, the decline in, in the bus industry over the last 25 years, um, to some extent, Merseyside is booking the trend. Uh, we have increased passenger, but, but that's down to this, this organisation that has implemented, including the mighty in here, and, and, and other factors that involved. Uh, Obviously, obviously, the bus alliance and the, the, the quality of vehicles that are being put into the police on Bursley side. Uh, that's all helped towards the, uh, the, the travelling public. The biggest barrier is affordability still. I mean, that needs to be stressed more and more. Uh, we have the highest hop, short hop fares, I think, in the country, uh, which is not acceptable. Uh, I think it's something that needs to be worked upon. But the select committee is looking at affordability of people travelling and also the impact that's had from local governments on the customer 
the austerity programme, and the impact that's had on our ability to plug gaps within the network, which does disenfranchise laws out of the community. We're a bit lucky on it within the region that we are somewhat cushioned, because we have a city uh, region authority to cushion some of the impact. We've been in the rural areas. Wholesale bus routes have been removed by local authorities because you know, can no longer afford to keep them going. And that, that isolates huge elements within communities. It leads to young people leaving communities and communities becoming in want of this way. Rest comes. Barriers and 
opportunities and trends uh, which might define um, mobility. Um, and they're also looking into fast mile freight and um, logistics on opportunities and moments there. It's right sort of moving from um, out of town consolidation centres and key depots into the last um, end user sort of retail and uh, domestic uh, dwelling stuff. Um, we're still working on the responses and um, the deadline is uh, Monday. Um, so some of the key themes emerging in our response at the moment include sort of showcasing the um, strengths of the city region and our capabilities and taking all of the universities, um, our city region parties for both carbon and um, sense of city and um, digital uh, technologies. Um, the grand challenge is quite far but there's a very opportunity to expand that particular development of transport and make the opportunity to review governance of traffic on demand mobility and into wider public transport and sort of look into regulatory issues of that sector and sort of get better awareness of uh, its role and um, how it fits together. And there may be opportunities to do um, mobility contracts rather than bus contracts in the future. And um, a really important area is skills training, job skill workforces, and life changing technologies, and they're not left behind and excluded, and making sure this growth is actually inclusive growth and includes everyone in the technologies and everyone's um, got access to uh, services. Stuff. And the um, Freight and logistics last mile one, we're sort of referencing our city region's uh, draft uh, freight strategy and the opportunities we're working on to get um, alternative fuels and uh, opportunity to try last mile was in our city region. So, which you have any thoughts? Excellent, that's Alex. Any questions or comments? Tony?